Well, the task of settling Moses Austin's land grant was passed to his son, Stephen, who Governor Martinez accepted as his father's successor. All along the Texas-Louisiana border, the word went out by handbills, newspapers, word of mouth. Austin was swamped by requests from people hungry for the land that Spain was offering at a tenth of the cost of the land in the United States. How did he decide to come down here? What made him choose this part of Texas? Well, the first thing they looked for was water. They had to have that, of course. Well, this river right here was one of the boundaries of the Austin Grant between the Brazos River and the Colorado River. See, the Spanish used rivers as landmarks. But first, Stephen F. Austin rode out into the Texas wilderness to look at the land. The first of many impresarios. You ought to see the Texas land. Grass up to your stirrups. Crystal clear water. Timber in abundance. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. Texas is laced with rivers and streams that run in parallel to each other from its northern borders to the Gulf. Forests give way to rolling prairie, a rich grassland. The color is deeper than any grain I have ever seen. It all seems still, solemn, beautiful beyond description. I can see the advantages of this climate and soil the possibilities for farming and cattle, ports and trade. I can see this great wilderness settled with industrious, intelligent, respectable colonists. And so after that, the colonists really started to move. Stopping first at Washington on the Brazos, and next at San Felipe de Austin, where Stephen F. Austin had set up his headquarters. Every new arrival brings a batch of letters from people seeking land. Listen, here's a good example. We are part of a considerable company of farmers who wish to remove to your grant. If you will write us word how this can be affected and how much of a settlement is already formed, we would wish to be informed whether there are many Indians in that quarter and whether friendly or hostile. You will please to give a good history of the country and how you have concluded to charge for the land and the quantity we may expect. But let me acquaint you again with the conditions the Spanish have set. The order reads, a colonist must take an oath of allegiance to be faithful to the Spanish king. He must be an honest, industrious farmer or tradesman. I will be held responsible for your conduct, you know. I understand that we must profess to be Catholics. That's right. We have met those conditions. And now, about payment, I'm authorized to charge 12 and one half cents per acre for services, but if you have no money, you can take care of that when your first crop comes in. You understand. The administration of this colony is my responsibility, but I'm here to help you with your problems. So Austin's job as an impresario was a tough one, and it was made tougher when Mexico won its independence from Spain. Just like in this country, there are a lot of problems in setting up a new government. So Austin had to go to Mexico City to have his grant approved by the new Mexican government. He was gone from Texas for over a year. While he was gone, his colony really suffered. There were illnesses and little medical attention, the Indians attacked, and all the crops were ruined by the drought. This is the last of the corn, Jason. The new crop's nearly gone. I knew it happened. We didn't get rain. Well, pray God you'll find game when you go out hunting tomorrow. Game's so scarce now. Makes my heart sick to see the children have eaten nothing all day, watching for me to return at night. How does she bear up under all this? A loneliness and terrible lack of comforts. Only her looks show her real feelings. I sometimes think we never should have come. It was a bad time for the colonists. Remember, they didn't have any way of keeping in touch with the world outside of Texas. And some of them did give up hope and go back. 
And with all their other troubles, you know, the colonists didn't yet have title to the land. They were farming it all right, but they didn't know how much of it was really theirs. But finally, Austin got back to the settlers, and they did get title to their land. Here's your grant, Mr. Williams. Confirmed, finally, after all these months. The oath I took back there in the cabin, uh, is that all that will be required? Yes, and the certificate as to your character, which I've signed and can attest to. There are easy terms for such beautiful land. Thank you, sir. 4,428 acres. I must get more stock immediately. Thomas told me that I could trade some seed for that calico you brought in from Missouri. That's good, and the Coopers are giving us their new calf for one of our mules. Colonel Austin had a letter from Bayer. He told me the priest will be through here next week. We must arrange to have the young one christened. I'm grateful he'll be here before our first year is over. Is this small cabin Mr. Austin's only home? Yes, but he says it's by his choice. Since he has no family, he doesn't require larger quarters. And it sets an example to the rest of the settlers. We're all poor in this country, and all equal. As long as that continues, we'll get on well. Does he supervise all the land grants himself? Yes, he goes around with all the families so they know what they're buying, just as he did with us. It's been a hard year, but I'm glad we stayed. And that's how it all began. In 1825, then, the Mexican government passed a law that opened this whole area up for colonization. The next five years, Mexico issued 25, maybe 30 new land grants to impresarios to bring colonists in to settle Texas. Wavell, Valen, Burnett, Zavala, these all went to the northeast areas. In the southwest, there were some Irishmen who brought colonists. Power and Hewittson first. They settled around Refugio. McGloin and McMullen came in right next to them. They actually brought people over from Ireland. Well, not every grant was given to a single man. Some groups did try to come in as a business venture, like, oh, the Nashville Company, for instance. It began with a man named Leftwich as its head. After his death, it was turned over to Sterling Robertson, then became known as the Robertson Colony. That grant was about 100 miles wide and 200 miles long. The most successful Mexican impresario was Martin de Leon to the south and west of Austin. De Leon was a rancher. He moved up from northern Mexico with over 40 families and settled them along the grassy coastal plains on the Guadalupe River. He founded the town of Victoria, but there's a lot of trouble with the Indians. You see, they came in after De Leon's horses and cattle. Senor De Leon, they made off with five horses and 11 had of cattle last night. The second rate this week. Get the vaqueros and be prepared to ride. We may be able to overtake them. Si, senor. Martin de Leon had other problems. Green DeWitt had been petitioning for a grant for years, finally got permission to settle near de Leon's colony. They had Indian problems, too. There is talk that Senor DeWitt will move his colonists to escape the Indian attack. His colonists are already trespassing on our territory. Perhaps if we brought in more Mexican families. I will go to DeWitt's colonists and tell them they must move. If that fails, I shall appeal to the government. Well, the real problem was that so many of the boundaries were so uncertain. Not only De Leon and DeWitt, but the Irish, Sterling Robertson. They all had problems with the boundaries. You see, at that time, there were no official surveys. There were only broad general descriptions that used rivers for boundaries. That caused a lot of problems. How did it work out between De Leon and DeWitt? Remember, De Leon was a native of Mexico and his colonists were Mexicans, and they were ranchers. Well, Mexico wanted ranchers. They saw Texas as cattle country. Since De Leon was a native of Mexico and a rancher, 
Mexican law provided that he had first choice, so the Witch Colony had to move. I can see why some of it had to be cattle country. 4,500 acres. Boy, that's a lot of land. How much land is it? Well, that's a big chunk. Think of it in terms of football field. Now, football field's almost an acre, so 4,500 acres would be nearly 4,000 football fields. How much did it cost? Well, Mexico was very generous at first. She didn't even tax the land for a while. The colonists were supposed to pay 12 and a half cents an acre to the impresario for surveying the land and getting their deeds and administering the colony. Some of them didn't even want to pay that. I suppose 12 and a half cents seemed like more money back in 1825 than it does now. You bet. And remember, some of the colonists that came were pretty hard pressed to raise that. Lots of them had lost everything back in the United States. Yeah, but it still must have taken a lot of nerve just to pick up and move down here, not knowing what you'd find or how you'd make out. You're right, it did. But these people had hope and they wanted land. Land was the lure. 